What's your role on the Federal Reserve? If you become, as it seems likely, one of the seven Board of Governors, you'll be on the Open Market Committee, which brings on the Fed Presidents. What's your, I what's the, your concept? I, I want to be the growth hawk, the one who knows that we can create three to four percent economic growth and it doesn't cause inflation. Uh, I, I, look, I'm, people are saying you're a dove. No, I'm not a dove. I don't want any inflation. I want, don't want deflation either. I believe that we can have high growth, high wages, low unemployment rates with no inflation. We had that, by the way, in the summer of 2018. We had the highest tax rate in the world on our businesses. Okay. You know, we said to Trump, this is like a, it's like we're charging a 20 percent, you know, uh, tariff on our own goods and services. How stupid right. is that? And Trump got that instantly. He loved the idea and, uh, you know, never flinched. And, you know, he, he actually wanted even a lower tax rate than we did. <laughs> If we want to reduce our carbon emissions and our other air pollutants, the way to do that is through economic growth and innovation and technology. That's what reduces, you know, that's what reduces the, uh, the stress on the environment. And the idea that we're going to have the government just take over our energy industry, you know, they want, some of the liberals want to get rid of 70% of our energy production. They want to get rid of oil, gas, coal. Some want to get rid of nuclear energy. That gives, you know, Joe or Bill or Sally or Kathy you know, who may not be happy with their current job, they can go down the street and find another job. Guess what? You're seeing companies like Target, uh, Walgreens, Walmart, uh, FedEx, uh, Costco. They're raising their wages, not because of a minimum wage, because they have, they're competing for workers. Okay. And that gives workers bargaining power. We love it. We love that story. Welcome to Public Affairs. Great show tonight. Really, really good show. We have as our guest Steve Moore. Everybody knows Steve Moore. He, well, number one, he's just written a book on Trumponomics. So if you don't understand what's going on with Trump and Trumponomics and economics, this will be the show to do it, okay? And, and more than that, he's nominated to the Federal Reserve Board. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk a lot about supply side economics. And um, Steve Moore, more about you as we get into the show. But just to start out right now, what is Trumponomics? Uh, it's putting America first. It's putting American businesses and American workers first. And we have a president who's finally doing that. Uh, it's made a world of difference. Um, the other part about Trumponomics that's different from so many previous administrations is this is a, a businessman who understands how business works. He's been a, brought a pro-business uh, sensibility to the White House, which has made a huge difference in terms of you know, the confidence that small businesses and large businesses have that they've got a president who isn't going to hit them over the head with a baseball bat if they make a profit or succeed. And so um, those two things are really important. I mean, when Trump was elected, you saw this gigantic spike up in small business confidence. They've realized that they had an ally in the White House. And as you know, because uh, you've covered this stuff for such a long time, small businesses are the central nervous system of our economy. You can't, we can't succeed without healthy small businesses. So that's what Trumponomics is all about. So you are, I would call you an economist. Some people would say you're a writer. You've written a number of books. You've written some with, with Art Laffer. This one is with Laffer. It was with Larry Kudlow, who became your silent partner. Right? <laughs> he when had he, a higher calling in life when he went over to the White House and is now the most economist, arguably the most important economist in the world today. And so that was a good reason to lose Larry as a co-author. But we, I worked side by side with uh, Larry during the campaign and helped you know, write the tax plan with Larry for Trump, and we're very proud of that and some of the deregulation efforts. And so it's been, uh, it's been quite a ride. And you know, I, even I didn't anticipate that the economy would be this strong so quickly. Yeah, and you've, um, <clears throat> of course, academically, you're at University of Illinois Champaign undergrad. U of I. George, U of I, right here. We're yeah. taping this in Chicago. Yeah. And, and then George Mason yep. University got your master's in economics right. there. That's sort of a place where you'd learn sort of what you might call free market economics. You better believe it. You know, supply I, side. Did yeah, you learn that there? That's for sure. Well, you know, I really learned a, you know, a lot at Illinois and George Mason, two great right. financial. Okay. I mean, uh, you know, academic institutions. But I learned, you know, uh, supply side economics from our Laffer. You know, just sitting at his knee and just listening to him explain how the real world works. And you know, so much of what's taught in economics today is just flat out wrong. You know, so many PhD economists believe in a Keynesian world where, you know, the government spending is good for the economy, which we know it isn't, or they think that, uh, you know, the government can just print money and somehow it's going to magically transform an economy. We know that's not true. We know that economics is about incentives. And if you increase incentives for people to work and save and start businesses, guess what? You're going to get more of them. There's an old saying, if you tax something, you get less of it. And if you tax something less, you get more of it. And that's really the essence of 
what Trumponomics and, <clears throat> and supply side economics is all about. So that, I mean, because Laffer is the sort of the inventor of supply side economics, yeah. the famous Laffer curve, yes. which we won't go into, but it's basically incentives. Yes. It kind of grew out of Chicago School economics, yes. which was because a Arthur counter went, reaction Arthur to. Arthur was at the University of Chicago. He was there Chicago, for a while. Yes. Yes, in the early seventies. So he knew right? Milton Friedman and George Stigler and many of the PhD and not just you know, the Nobel Prize winners that changed the world at University of Chicago. But Arthur, I mean, you'd have to make the case that Arthur may be the most today the most influential economist you know in terms of uh, you know changing the way the world looks at economics um, so proud to have worked with them on so many of these projects so and you know, Larry Kudlow I don't know I mean I've everybody's seen Larry we've he talked was the I've best man him. of my wedding That's was he okay he is, you know. is he is he a natural supply sider as well oh yeah well okay. I don't know what you mean by natural but he certainly from you know, the beginning or did it, it take know, a while to get him there? so you'll love this so about three years ago Art Laffer Larry Kudlow, Steve Forbes, and I started a group called the Committee to Unleash Prosperity to try to help, you know, uh, you know, promote pro-economic growth right. ideas. And, you know, I, I, people said, hey, you guys are the supply side Beatles. And I said, yeah, I'm Ringo. I bang the drum. They make the music. But, you know, those, those three have had such a profound impact on our country, and I'm proud to be, you know, part of that gang. Okay, and so flash ahead. Well, you were at Cato, you were at Heritage, you're at Heritage again now. You were writing editorials for the Wall Street Journal. So uh, aside from writing this book, other books, in the long around 2015, you were looking at, uh, they were like 15, 16 candidates running in the Republican primary for president. You had a tax ideas, tax plan. I suppose Laffer did, Kudlow. You all got, you three were pushing this. You were talking to whoever would talk to you, yeah. right? Yeah. And then how'd you, how'd you end up, was it just like, uh, you went through some others and then you yeah. went to Trump? Well, you know, we, I think there were, you're right, about 15 Republicans running for president. What a field that was, by right. the way. Jeb Bush and, you know, Marco Rubio and people like John Kasich and Scott Walker. Some, you know, that was the A-team of maybe the best field of Republican candidates ever. And uh, I think I knew 14 of the 15 candidates. I'd, the only one I'd never met was Donald Trump. And uh, I, by the way, I worked with Rand Paul. You know, I right. love Rand. He's a good friend and l love what he stands for. I worked a little bit with Carly Fiorina. Remember, she was a I remember Carly, worker. right. Yeah. And uh, so I was really proud to work with them. By the way, we said we would work with the Democrats, too, if they wanted to, but they didn't they want didn't our call advice. You, right? <laughs> uh, but um, Trump, I think what really impressed me about Trump was the kind of people he was um, – that were attracted to his campaign were blue collar workers who'd been left behind in the second Bush term and the two disastrous Obama terms that where we just saw so little growth and people felt like they were on a uh, you know treadmill just running running and faster and faster to stay in place and Trump spoke to these people and you know when I met him I was just blown away with him he had the look of, of a winner and you know people say well you just got to you know because he was winning no I knew that Donald Trump, if he was the Republican nominee, would, would beat Hillary Clinton because he had such a positive, optimistic message about America. And people want optimism. They want to know that the country can still grow and that we can, as Trump said, make America great again. And, you know, that was a great theme. And, uh, boy, did he pull off a, one of the great upsets in American political history. So you saw these folks. We'll get to the meeting where you sort of came together and started sketching out or putting meat on the tax plan. Yeah. But, be, but during along the way, but since you've mentioned it, you mentioned the people who supported yeah. them. These were sort of used to be Reagan Democrats. They were blue-collar yes. voters who were sort of the forgotten oh, yeah. man. They were kind of left behind. Booming economy in Clinton years. Uh, the, the economy had gone the great crash in 28. Yeah. It sort of come back in Obama, but very, very the slow. slowest post-World yes, post War II economic recovery, right? right? Okay. Yep. So people were people were financially stressed out. They didn't feel like the country was going in the right direction. Uh, under Obama, we had a recovery, but it was measly. All we did was just add debt, you know, more and more debt. Right. And um, people realized this is not a long-term solution to our economic problems. Do Either get... late 2015 or early 2015. Okay. The campaign was just getting going. So, and you had this tax, tax, your tax plan. Yes. You and Codlow and Laffer, yeah. you were pitching it. Yeah. You went in, he had his tax yeah. plan. He wanted somebody who could maybe, as he said, put some meat on yeah. the bones, some put some flesh, maybe add yeah. more credibility to it. He knew what he it. wanted to do. He knew what he wanted to do, yeah. but he needed you three guys, right? Well, I mean, you know, uh, he said, can you, can you just make sure the numbers add up and things uh -huh. like that? You know, so we worked on it, and it was a lot of fun, and we came back with them. And, he, you know, one thing I like about Donald Trump, you know, uh, you know, he's, he, he doesn't like yes men, and he's not a yes man. I mean, he said, I like this idea, I don't like that idea. He'd always say, you know, well, this plan, this is important. 
how will this plan affect small businesses? You know, because we've we've got you know twenty six million small businesses in this. Country. He asked that. Yeah, he'd always say, "Are you sure this is going to help the small businessman and woman who are you know five, eight, twelve, fifteen, twenty five employees? You know, the auto mechanic shop or the you know grocery corner grocery store or the small you know light manufacturing firm or trucking firm." He'd say, "I want to make sure those companies are doing well." And the other thing he said is, "I don't want this to be a tax cut for rich people." He said, "Look, I'm rich." You know, millionaires and billionaires are doing fine. I want to make sure that this benefits, you know, working class Americans. And he'd always ask that. And I'm, I'm proud that we're seeing wages grow now. After-tax incomes are growing for workers. The Wall Street Journal reported a couple of weeks ago that the biggest wage gains have been for the lowest income workers. That's exactly what we wanted. And so it was across the board in terms of individual tax cuts, low income, middle class, high income. But... That's necessary to spur growth, to spur employment, right? Well, we wanted to provide businesses a tax cut so that you would get more capital investment. You'd get more, rather than having businesses leave, you know, Michigan for Mexico, we wanted companies to go from Mexico or back to Michigan. So and make it more competitive yeah, internationally, make it more internationally competitive. as yes, well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The international competitiveness part was a big part of it. Yeah. You know, we had the highest tax rate in the world on our businesses. Okay. You know, we said to Trump, this is like a, it's like we're charging a 20 percent, you know, uh, tariff on our own goods and services. How stupid right. is that? And Trump got that instantly. He loved the idea and, uh, you know, never flinched. And, you know, he, he actually wanted even a lower tax rate than we did. <laughs> so you got that. And then wages, as you say, have been moving up now. Oh, yeah. Especially for workers, for yeah. middle class people. And for that had been decades. It had yeah. been dormant. And how, why is that? How did the tax... How, Two did, how did your tax rate affect wages Two for reasons. those folks? First of all, businesses are investing more. And you need businesses to invest more to have you know, more and higher paying jobs. It makes workers more productive. In other words, if a company buys more computers or, you know, a truck and company buys another truck, which is a capital investment, you need another truck driver to drive that truck. Uh, if the companies, you know, um, invest more in software and research and development, their companies become more profitable and the business can pay more. The other thing we did was we created a very tight labor market right now. I mean, this is the maybe the tightest <coughs> labor market in, in 50 years. You know, if you look at right now, my favorite number, 7.1 million. You know what that number is? That's how many surplus jobs there are today. Unfilled jobs. 7.1 million. Is that million. right? 7. That's point, a wow. gigantic number. That's more than the Unfilled entire, jobs. entire state of Indiana. Wow. And there's that six, puts pressure on wages. Yeah, sure it does. Quite there's 6 million unemployed people and 7.1 million jobs. Think about what that means. Right. If we placed every single unemployed in American in a job, we'd still have a million jobs to fill. So that gives, you know, Joe or Bill or Sally or Kathy, you know, who may not be happy with their current job, they can go down the street and find another job. Guess what? You were seeing companies like Target, uh, Walgreens, Walmart, uh, FedEx, uh, Costco. They're raising their wages, not because of a minimum wage, because they have, they're competing for workers. Okay. And that gives workers bargaining power. We love it. We love that story. And so you, you've you seen, and you passed it at the end of you, the Trump and his administration passed that uh, tax cut at the end of 2017, yes. and 2018 you got what more than three percent. Well, growth, we got right? just 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 over three percent. Well, it's, I think the final number is like 2.94. Okay. I'm going to call it three percent. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, that's a you know we never got three percent growth in a single year under Barack Obama, so that's a pretty solid performance. There were a lot of economists like Larry Summers, who was the president of Harvard University and the chief economist for Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, who said that it's impossible to get 3% growth. Uh, and, you know, here we are, we got it. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't happen by accident. You know, I love these people who say, oh, this is the Obama effect. Why is that so important? People might say, Obama, one and a half to two, two yeah. and a half percent. You folks, 3%. Oh, What's the difference between 2% and 3%? It doesn't seem like a lot, right? I mean, you hear that. Yeah, people I know, say, you do. Yeah, and it's yeah. hard for, you know, like, these people, these numbers are, you know, a jumble of numbers. But, you know, the difference between 2 and 3% growth, I, one way of thinking about it is the difference between going 20 miles an hour down the highway and 30 miles an hour down the highway. You get, you get where you're going a lot faster at 30 miles per hour. By the way, the last year Obama was in office, 1.5, 1.6% right. growth. Below two, so we've yeah. doubled it. <clears throat> right. We've doubled the growth rate we inherited. That's a pretty good record. So is that the story or because I also, from reading the book, you put a lot of emphasis on deregulation. Yeah. You put oh, yeah. a lot of emphasis on energy exploration, uh, unleashing the constraints on re uh, increasing supply of oil, yeah. gas, shale, yeah. all that stuff. It's a big part of it. I mean, both of those. But I think the deregulation 
may be the most important factor. And, um, you know, when I remember one of the first meetings we had with Trump, he had his business industry economic council, and it was CEOs of major companies, whether in transportation, manufacturing, financial services, energy. And I remember he asked each one around the table, you know, what's your biggest problem? And I think two thirds of them said the regulatory stranglehold of government and, the, and all the strings attached and all the cost of complying with all these regulations. And what Trump has done is eased that grip around the neck of businesses. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean we don't want clean air or clean water or safe workplaces or you know, a safe financial system. Of course we want that. But we also want to do it in a way that doesn't inhibit our com companies from growing. Look, it's very simple. We're, America competes now in a global economy. We're competing with China. We're competing with Germany. We're competing with Japan. We're competing with Mexico, Australia, you know, uh, all of Europe. If we don't have the most pro-growth, pro-business environment, those businesses will go somewhere else. I mean, so, we know that. Now the skeptics, and Illinois knows that, by the way. Why do you think businesses are leaving Illinois? It's obvious <clears> because you don't reward your businesses. You know, and I hear, keep hearing all this talk about you wanting to raise taxes in Illinois. Progressive tax. Ah, yeah, you don't think a progressive tax is crazy. Go. Oh, my gosh. You're going to lose so many jobs if you tax your businesses. You say, oh, it's gonna, I saw this ad the other day. Oh, it's only going to be the top 3% they are going to pay the taxes. Who are those 3%? They're the business owners. They're the employers of the state. You're going to punish them? They're not going to be here. Then who are you going to tax? So, uh, <laughs> Sorry, but I mean, I feel very strongly about yeah, this. It's no, a and very and big and mistake. We're, we're in Chicago. Where people are seeing us in Illinois. Yeah. People say, hey, if you only tax 3%, as you say, everybody else is not affected by it. You know, the businesses are wealthy. They've got the money. They're top 1%. You hear that. Yeah. How do you persuade them that actually what you just said is true? You're going to lose a lot of jobs math. in Illinois. You know, what, let's say they raise the tax rate to 8, 9, 10 percent. What's 10 percent of zero? Zero. Right. Because they, they, people aren't they're here mobile. anymore. You they're can't mobile. tax. Of course. You can take the businesses out. Of course. The, the individuals who I are making the money can go country. out. I go to Texas. I go to Tennessee. I go to Florida. I go to Arizona. I go to North Carolina. All I see is Illinois license plates. A lot of those states are zero income tax yeah. states. Yeah. You better and believe it. So uh, you're going to charge 8 or 10 percent here in Illinois, and they can pay zero? And, okay. and by the way, they're already leaving, and that's before the tax increase. So that's just a, a dumb policy, in my opinion. Very stupid. And I think it will be counterproductive for the uh, state of Illinois, and I think it'll hurt the very low income people that need jobs. So on the national level though, so as you know we had that big crash in 2008 and Obama came in, he said he turned it around, it was slow growth after but he said that wasn't his fault and then he says we needed to prevent that crash again. So they passed Dodd-Frank, they passed Sarbanes-Oxley, are those things good, bad? What's your assessment? Um, I'm not an expert on financial deregulation. I have to become an expert. But I'll say this, that I, th I think the big deal is what's, what Dodd-Frank did was impose a lot of new regulations on banks. And the banks that got hurt the most by that policy were small community banks. We saw a disappearance of a lot of community. You know, the small bank down the street that knew the people in the village and the community. And a lot of those banks went bankrupt because they couldn't absorb the cost. The big ones like Bank of America, Citibank, Morgan Stanley, they had the resources to do it. So we squashed the very small businesses that are, again, the heartbeat of America. So a lot of the regulations that you, that you removed or that Trump removed wasn't really Sarbanes-Oxley, wasn't Dodd-Frank. Those, that layer still exists in the well, financial Well, we tried industry. to repeal uh, Dodd-Frank, but we didn't have the votes to do it. So we made some changes to it that have made it less onerous, but we still have work to do in that area, no question about it. So on the energy side, what have you done there that's been dramatic? Just gotten a lot of the regulations out of the way. Trump is so proud of the fact that we are now the number one uh, you know, uh, oil and gas producer in the world. We are now, did you know we're producing more oil and gas now than we consume? So for the first time, in probably 50 years, we're actually a net exporter right. of oil and gas. And because we uh, allowed more drilling, we some of the most onerous regulations that came place in the, because remember, Obama, the Obama administration hated the fossil fuel industry. So they did everything they could to try to strangle it. Trump likes this industry and wants to help it. And, you know, look, we want to be environmentally conscious. We want to make sure we're not, you know, uh, contributing to global warming and things of that nature, but there's a way you can produce American energy and, and be environmentally conscious. And I think, that, by the way, we've reduced our carbon emissions in the last two years more than any other country. Did you know that? That's because we're producing more natural gas. So despite, despite the opposition to the climate agreement and all of that, you're saying you agree there is an, is an do you actually do you agree? Do you think that's useful to look at the carbon imprint and try to reduce that? I do. 
I, I, I'm not an expert on this. I'm not a scientist. But you wouldn't do what the Climate Accord was going to do in no, terms no. of restricting climate, economic growth. Oh my and gosh! All of that. You don't want to strangle yeah. your economy. You want look. I, I'm a big believer that if we want to reduce our carbon emissions and our other air pollutants, the way to do that is through economic growth and innovation and technology. That's what reduces. You know, that's what reduces the uh, the stress on the environment. And the idea that we're going to have the government just take over our energy industry. You know, they want, some of the liberals want to get rid of 70% of our energy production. They want to get rid of oil, gas, coal. Some want to get rid of nuclear energy. So these, mean, thinks, these folks think you can do it all with clean energy and you can substitute for all of those energy sources. Natural gas said. is a clean energy. That's the thing. Natural why, gas why, is why, clean. So why are the and liberals so, is nuclear power. Why are the libs so upset with uh, I don't know. I don't know gas. why they're against natural I, gas. I thought it was all carbon and oil and all that. Well, but they say, also oh, but there's leakage well. and you put yeah. some, you know, methane in the environment and so on and so forth. I mean... Look, so they're looking uh, to do it completely wind and solar. Completely? Yeah, and that's just not going to work. It's like half a percent now, yeah. or what no, is well, it? Well, yeah. no, we get about five percent. Five percent, okay. From wind and solar. Okay. Well, maybe then we could go to ten or fifteen or twenty yeah. percent, but we're not going to go to fifty, eighty, yes. hundred percent. I mean, right. and by the way, you know, they're talking about getting rid of automobiles and getting rid of airplanes and you know, uh, putting restrictions on when you can drive and who you can drive and you know, this is an assault on individual freedom. That's what this is about. And you know, think of this: we've probably got ten million people working the oil, gas coal, nuclear energy industry, they're going to put all those people out of their jobs? Come on. All right, so we covered on the DREG, the energy, the tax rate, all of that's sort of the core. Would you say that's the core of uh, Trump economics? I think the core is the overriding principle, which is that we want to be pro-business. And it it's uh -huh. runs through every policy decision. Not pro-free market, whether actually pro-business. Pro well, pro, what I mean, pro Is there a difference between in, free inhibiting, there's no, look, if you want to be pro-worker, you have to be pro-business. Okay. I'm not for in favor of special favors for okay. business. I'm for making American businesses the most competitive in the world. So we out-compete the Chinese. We out-compete the Japanese. We out-compete the Germans. That's what I'm for, and that's I think I know what okay. Trump is for, and that's what what <clears throat> it means to just put America first. So, but when you when you signed on, you and Kudlow and Laffer had some concerns about his trade, Trump's trade and immigration yes. policies, as it was stated yes. in early 2016. Yes. And he would say, yeah, he's a free trader, but he's a fair. He's also more fair trade. Or if you're going to have free trade, you have to have fair yeah. trade. And he wanted to clamp down on illegal Im immigration. He wanted border enforcement. Yeah. Did you get okay with that stuff? You know, I still have disagreements with Donald Trump. I mean, that's one thing I like about, you know, working with him is that, you know, you can disagree. You can, you know, you don't have to be drinking the Kool-Aid all the time. But on the trade side, where uh, are the so disagreements? On the trade side, side, look, I think his, his uh, steel tariffs are um, a bad idea. Okay. I think the aluminum tariffs are a bad idea. I hope we don't have these new auto tariffs. I think that actually hurt our American auto industry. The industry itself doesn't want the tariffs. Um, when it comes to China, I'm with him on this. I think China is a huge problem on the international stage. <clears throat> We're in an abusive relationship with China. They cheat. They steal. They lie. You know, they're involved in cyber uh, t security attacks against us. They're hacking into our computer systems. That's not the behavior of a friendly country, right? Does the currency manipulation really hurt? Can they can they do it in a way I that benefits not, them? I'm not an expert on how they. Do or is the it more the stealing of technology? I, I, it's it? more that. Yeah, yeah, it's more the stealing. We're not paying for Three, intellectual we property. We estimate, you know, um, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of stolen technology. You know, think about like in Silicon Valley, we're producing computer software, new technologies, and robotics, and new drugs and vaccines and patents and copyrights, they just steal that stuff and so, they don't pay us for it. So merge this, merge all of what we're talking about. People, I think, have a pretty good sense of who you are, what your economic views are. You're now nominated to the Federal Reserve Board. Mm -hmm. What's your role on the Federal Reserve? If you become, as it seems likely, one of the seven Board of Governors, you'll be on the Open Market Committee, which brings on the Fed Presidents. What's your, I what's the, your concept? I, I want to be the growth hawk, the one who knows that we can create Three to four percent economic growth, and it doesn't cause inflation. Uh, I, I look. I'm, people are saying you're a dove. No, I'm not a dove. I don't want any inflation. I want. I don't want deflation either. I believe that we can have high growth, high wages, low unemployment rates with no inflation. We had that, by the way, in the summer of 2018. Lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. Almost no inflation. Wage gains, and you know. So I, I just want to be the one who's promoting the idea of stable prices a very strong economy, and every time we have growth or high wages, if the Fed pulls back, you know, then how are we going to get workers to be better off? I mean, we, workers want a bigger paycheck. I want a bigger paycheck for them. If we get the right policies at the Fed and, uh, you know, with our taxes and deregulation, I'm the biggest optimist. I think we could grow 3 to 4% for another five years. 
And what would you what do you think most of the the other six governors or other five who are there now, including the chairman, what would they say? Do they say there's a statute that tells us what the goals should be? Well, there is a statute. Two percent. You know, there's a, a statute, oh, it's called a dual mandate yeah. of trying to get to full employment and low inflation. You agree um, with that? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the, the way you get to full employment is not by monkeying around with the money supply. What you want to do is create a, why do you have dollars in your pocket? Why do you hold a five and a 10 and a 20? Why do you put money in a bank uh, in dollars? Because you have a reasonable assurance that, that those dollars will be pretty much worth today what they'll be worth two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. So a that currency, price stability is important to <laughs> everybody in the country. You can't have a good. To everybody in the country. Yes, you can't have a growing. Look at Venezuela now. You think anybody want, want, puts Venezuela pesos in their pocketbook? They're not going to be worth anything tomorrow. So I want to retain the sanctity of the dollar and make sure that it's you know, as good as gold, that it, it basically retains its value over time. And that's, you know, we have a great advantage in the American economy that we're the world currency. Everybody, you, you go anywhere in the world, people want dollars. Why? They have, they have faith in the dollar. Stability. I want, to, I want yeah. to keep that faith. But some of those Board of Governors, some of those folks seem to believe in the Phillips curve. You know about that. Yeah. That says when, totally you, wrong. And when, you, when you start lowering unemployment, as we are now to 3.8%, you're going to get a boost in inflation. You disagree? course. I mean, that's the yeah. dumbest idea. You don't have to have that economics. at all. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you've got an economy that's producing more goods and services, the price of goods and services falls. I mean, it doesn't rise. I, I don't even understand the logic of the Phillips curve, frankly. It's totally counterintuitive. As Art Laffer says, if the economy produces more apples, the price of apples falls. It doesn't rise. So the whole concept of the Phillips curve is back asswards, in my opinion. So what do you do when you're on the Fed to boost the rate of growth? To you keep prices stable. Look, the Fed can, you can't, print money and then think that that's going to create jobs. That's just a mythology, right? What you want to do is keep, keep the dollar stable. Uh, and, and, you know, that's what I will want to be in favor of. Now, look, if there's some kind of, you know, n natural disaster or financial crisis, you know, then you, you need to be flexible to deal with that. But in normal times, I just want to keep those prices stable uh, over time. I don't want inflation. I don't want deflation. Inflation caused the crash in the economy in the 70s, and deflation caused the, uh, you know, the crisis in the uh, 1930s when they had the Great Depression. So do you do that? Do you, do you keep that, accomplish your goals? Do you do that through monetary policy of controlling the money stock? Or do you do that by prices. controlling interest rates? What you do, no, you want, what you want to do is monitor prices. And you want to keep prices stable over time, looking at maybe what's happening with commodity prices, consumer prices, asset values to make sure that you're not having a big bubble. We had the, you know, we had the big crisis in 2008, 2009. In, you know, there were a lot of reasons for the crisis. But one of them was the Fed kept pushing easy money into the economy. And that, a lot of that money went into real estate. And you saw what happened, the real estate bubble burst and it caused huge damage to American families and businesses. So you do that by focusing on prices? Yeah. I want and to you, keep it stable. But do you do you do anything so should we be concerned that you know the the Fed had uh, what they call it uh, quantitative easing for a long time. Then they started boosting interest rates. Then President Trump has gotten concerned, said they shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with him on that? I think the Ted has been Fed has been a little too tight. In the last six months, I didn't like their December rate increase. I thought it was um, ill-designed, and, and of course, I was right about that. I was the first person to say it was a mistake, and you know, you know guess what? The Fed even had to admit it made a mistake. Are they sort of backing year. off now? Would you say? Yeah, they well, they backed off. Uh, I think it was either late December or early January of last year, and they said, "Oh, we made a mistake here." So, uh, look, I I have not met Jerome Powell. I can't wait to meet him. I don't have all the answers. I mean, the first thing I'm going to do when I get over there is just understand better how the whole system works and, you know, get the insider's view. So I'll, I think, you know, for the first six months or a year, I'm just going to try to, you know, learn and, and become a very, um, I want to be a valued asset to Chairman Powell to make him a success. All right. We're out of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve Moore, Trumponomics. It's a great read. It's really a lot of insights into the Trump administration on economics, on other issues. And we only half covered what we're supposed to. So you're going to come back, right, Steve? I promise I will. Thank All you right. for All right. Thank me. you so much, Steve. Take care. Steve Moore. Public Affairs very much thanks Residco, our sole corporate underwriter, for helping to make the production of this show possible.